Hello, gang. Professor McElroy here, February 2023, digital illustration class, GRA 2156. Uh, this session is all about, you would guess it, digital illustration. Uh, we're going to spend this four week session in Adobe Illustrator and only in Adobe Illustrator. Hopefully, we're going to spend this these four weeks developing a little bit of a personal illustration style. Start to kind of create our own digital illustration portfolio platform, uh, kind of characteristics of you know how you draw, how you create an illustrator uh, that's unique to you. Uh, I have to say I've been teaching illustration for a long time, uh, and digital illustration for me has evolved over time. Uh, now with the iPad, my Apple Pencil, what I did as a pen tool only environment has quickly evolved into paintbrush, uh, pencil, sketch, overlay, coloring in, uh, and kind of creating my own look and feel over the years. Uh, I started off drawing on a notepad, scanning the drawing in, bringing it into Illustrator, live tracing it or drawing over the top of it, uh, creating vector art out of it. And I had a very kind of loose illustration style. But over the 25 years or so doing graphic design, my kind of digital drawing style, I guess you'd say, has become much more modern, much more graphic, and much more iconography in nature because I do so much logo work. Um, this uh, digital illustration class uses a little bit of a different book. It's a digital illustrator who wrote a book which I really enjoy, I like. I like the projects of, I like the process of teaching. Uh, the first two chapters in your book are all about the pen tool, the Bezier curve and the Pathfinder tool in essence. Uh, we're gonna cover a bunch of different things in our lecture tonight. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep the lecture to an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes or so. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some different techniques for drawing in Illustrator, just to start talking about you know, how you can start exploring your own personal style of illustration, uh, because we're going to do a lot of drawing in class, obviously. Uh, so we're going to use that for spot illustrations. We're going to draw illustrations for advertising purposes. We're going to do posters. We're going to do all kinds of illustrative graphics. Uh, so with that being said, we obviously have to practice all of the drawing tool processes. Um, if you have an iPad and an Apple Pencil and you have Adobe Draw, um, I welcome any tablet kind of exploration. Lots of students in the past that have owned uh, the Wacom tablets and all those kind of drawing tablets have used them. Some students still like to kind of doodle sketch on paper and then uh, bring that drawing into Illustrator and play around with it. All of the above is acceptable. We're just trying to get better at using Illustrator and digital illustration because it really is a main aspect of, of visual communication of graphic design. Whether I'm making icons for our website, a home button, uh, little icons for different things, whether I'm doing an illustration for packaging design, a uh, coffee bean, or I'm drawing some kind of pattern that I'm using in Photoshop for an advertisement. Maybe I need to create some ivy or vines or something like that, uh, all the way down to digital sketching and things like that for t-shirt designs, for vehicle graphics, anything that's vector, anything that's colorful, anything that's scalable. All of those things are created in Illustrator. I just finished a t-shirt and a vehicle graphic for a nonprofit I sit on the board of. Lots of drawing, drawing, drawing. I like it. I like it a lot. I used to draw in sketch pads all the time. And it's funny to say, but my mom saved them. So I've got like 80 sketch pads that I move around from house to house that I used to draw when I was younger, all the way up to college when I started studying graphic design. So I like to draw. I've taken pen to paper away and I do a lot more digitally. I do a lot more with my iPad. I have an iPad mini, which I absolutely love because it's the size of a small sketchbook, which is what I used to draw in. I used to do pen and ink only, black and white sketches, very graphic kind of stuff. Um, and that kind of evolved over to the iPad, which is how I do it now. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes when I'm sitting in meetings, I have my pen and paper out. Instead of taking notes, I'm doodling around the room or something. Uh, but I love to draw. So uh, it's just kind of part of design for me. And I love creating brands, logos, and 
most logos are combination marks. And the combination is a symbol and text. And the symbol is some illustration graphic of some kind. Uh, so I really enjoy it. The more you practice it, the better you get. Uh, now, don't be like, oh my God, I hate to draw. So life is going to be really terrible for me this session. It is not going to be. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. We're going to sketch for perspective and for proportion and things like that and doodle over the top of photographs to get started, all kinds of things to make sure that uh, we're drawing things that effectively are proportioned and scaled visually correctly. Uh, with that being said, there's a million digital illustrators that draw everything out of proportion and out of scale, and they've created a really cool style out of it. So we're trying to find kind of how you use the pen tool, how you use the pencil, the paintbrush, that sort of thing, how you get comfortable, what Pantone colors are and why you should use them, uh, and how you can also do custom colors and things like that if you're just printing a four color process. So we're going to kind of cover all the basics tonight in that drawing environment. We're going to doodle a little bit tonight. I'm dreaming of spring, so I have a bird to download and we're going to play around with it a little bit, draw all over the top of it, talk about things, different ways to kind of create digital art. Uh, and then hopefully that'll lead us in uh, to your homework, which is your out of book project. So first things first, uh, let's go into our modules. You'll notice my announcements and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. I did download all the chapters, uh, student files for you, the book files. So you can go to peachpit.com and download them also. I cleaned out the folders a little bit because the original download was like six gig uh, and I cut it down to about three gig because they had two and three different versions of the Illustrator file all embedded in all of the photos folders. So I deleted anything that wasn't a CC file and kind of cleaned it up a little bit for you. So you can download it here. Just be patient. It's three gigs and it's a lot of folders and files. It's a lot of little mini projects. Uh, so I'm going to open up the book and kind of talk a little bit about the mini projects. Uh, so we can just kind of get a grasp uh, for some of the practice we're doing. The practice in the book is just for our out of book projects. Uh, so I want you to touch and doodle on each of the mini projects in your book. You know, you'll only have to give me the one at the end of the chapter, just the last little mini project in the chapter. But I want you to doodle and practice and play and read each of the mini projects. The chapters aren't that long. It's a really small book. It's really easy to read. The projects are kind of cool. They're very graphic. It just gives you practice. You got to practice drawing, practice, practice, practice. And I hate saying that, but I'm still practicing 28 years later. I mean, drawing is hard. Digitally, drawing is even harder. And I'm drawing with my right hand and I'm left-handed. So just imagine, it takes a little bit longer. It takes more practice. Uh, I was watching something the other day and I was kind of, the new cars are coming out and I was watching a video on a car and it's from Europe and the seats on the other side of the car and it's a manual transmission. So they're driving with their left hand, the stick, the manual transmission. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I'm left-handed. I don't even know if I could do that because I've driven stick for a long time and it's right hand. So that kind of thing, it just takes time and practice and getting comfortable and that sort of thing. And you truly will develop your own style. We can use the same tools the entire class over and over and over again. And everyone's gonna see, visualize and create differently. Textures, shapes, how they see things. And that's what makes it beautiful, right? That's what makes it beautiful. I just saw an article the other day that they just arrested a husband and wife couple. I think they were in Germany. They had faked like 300 paintings from different styles of artists in Europe. And they didn't copy it. They learned about the artists and copied their style and made original paintings to mimic the style, the, the subject matter, the characteristics of all these artists and sold them for hundreds of millions of dollars. And the only reason they were caught was because one pigment of ink that they bought from one particular vendor ran out and they bought it from another vendor and the other vendor didn't say that there was metal inside of the mixture of the ink. And when they did a scan of one of the paintings to verify it, they found the metal and the metal that you would use in that paint was after 1930 and the paintings were all from the early 1900s. So they finally dug a little deeper and they found out that this person had copied the style of a half dozen famous 
late 1800, early 1900 artists and sold the paintings as originals and made hundreds of millions of dollars. So it is amazing what you can do with a little bit of practice. I don't even know if I practiced a lot, if I could copy Picasso or you know <laughs> Rembrandt or some famous painters or illustrators, but God bless that couple. They figured it out. She did the research, he did the drawing. I can't even believe that, but um, so you're gonna have your own unique style. So it's, a pra it's practice, right? It's just getting comfortable, you know, doing it, starting to develop an eye for shape, for color, how you see things, black and white grayscale versus color, and all those things will evolve over time. I love that Hodges has a specific class for each software application. So there's a Photoshop class, there's an Illustrator class, there's an in InDesign class, there's a Dreamweaver class. Not only do you have Graphic Design 1, Graphic Design 2, and all the classes that have bundles of applications based on kind of the output of what you're creating, but there's also software specific. So not only are you learning the application of, you're getting some really in-depth practice in each of the software applications, which I really appreciate. Uh, and I'll be going home tonight after class and I have some projects I have to do for a client. So I'll be drawing again. I'll be using Photoshop again. I'll be building some web pages again. So, I mean, I, I love it. That's why I got into the field. That's why I do it. That's why I teach it. So practice, right? So if you got a little extra time, day and night, you just were doodling around, whether it's on paper, maybe it's on the computer, whatever it is, it'll only help you in the long run. Okay, so let's hop in uh, really quick to learning module one. We're gonna go into kind of the beginning of the course because I just wanna open up uh, the book really quickly. So remember, you have your bookshelf link, you click on that, and you're going to have a vector basics book that should appear inside of your digital bookshelf, your portal, whatever you want to call it. And this book has been around for a few years. Uh, the beauty about Illustrator is it doesn't get old. Um, and this artist has a really kind of cool style for teaching uh, some of the basic elements. And you'll notice that chapter one is just all about the Bezier curve. I spend a lot of time talking through the process of how to draw with the pen tool. And this author gives you a little bit of history on it. It gives you some files in chapter one to trace around like this car practicing the Bezier curve, seeing how well you can curve around the headlight, just basic outlining of images and figures. This is just for practice. The beginning of each of these chapters are mini projects that are just for practice. You're gonna see this illustration, another opportunity to practice the outline of the head, the hair, maybe try to zoom in and do a little bit of the highlighting or tinting of the hair inside of this face. Just another photo raster-based template to trace around versus illustrator illustration tracing around. Obviously the outline of the car is much simpler than all these little mini shapes inside of his face, but the act of practicing it and seeing that there's different shades of skin tone and each shade of skin tone is a shape, gives you the opportunity to doodle, to sketch. There is an illustrator file attached to this. There's a PDF, there's a TIFF, and there's an AICC file. You can open those up. It gives you the template. You can practice doodling it a little bit. Um, it talks to you about the process of the Bezier curve. And we're going to talk about the forward directional anchor and the back directional anchor and those sorts of things. And the book does a great job of explaining all the shapes that make up the illustration, which is that guy, which you can see right here, the, all the shapes and the Bezier curves and all the closing shapes and all the open loose lines and all the things that create. And then it has simple shapes, patterns, and how to create a shape for a pattern and replicate that shape. And it just gives you, all of these are files inside of your chapter one. Practice drawing these letters. There is a file in there that just gives you basic little notes about the process, what they call field notes about the process. And then you're gonna see design drills. Every chapter is exactly the same. I'm only gonna describe the chapter one just to kind of open the eyes towards the process of the book because it is a little bit different than the Adobe CC book, but it's a really good one. And it has all of these projects, these figures in your book. Uh, the last one 
is a lettering shape project with these little letters penned out and shaped. This is a really good one to practice because of each little closed shape in this lettering. It actually shows you right here all of the overlapping shapes and all of the things that make up this little illustration. These are really great little practice files. This is the easiest of the complex shapes, I think, because it is just independent shapes. So this is the pattern in your book that I asked the students to give me as their submitted practice, using the pen tool and drawing these shapes. It seems like a lot, and you may struggle with, let's say, this first blue shape right here, which is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight shapes. This one is probably the best place to start, kind of just drawing and curving and shaping. And then once you got this one, you can move on to this one. Uh, this one is the one that I'll take for your project. Just save it as a PDF. The last illustration in each one of your chapters is the one I would like you to truly practice until you get it looking good and then submit it to me as a PDF. Your chapter book files have all of these, has all the lettering, the shapes, all the different things. I'd like you to take a shot at practicing each one, tracing these letters, just starting to figure out straight lines versus curve lines and Bezier curves. We're gonna do that tonight. We're gonna practice again. And you've heard it before and you've done Illustrator before, you've used pen tool before, but it's about just getting comfortable visually, how things are drawn, what they look like in multiple shape environments, what it looks like to illustrate a person versus just general shapes versus lettering that you're doing by hand versus a typeset, all the different ways vector graphics can be introduced into a digital drawing that all kind of interact a little bit differently. So uh, it's, I think, four little mini projects. And the last one being this blue pattern, the blue pattern is what I would like you to submit for me for chapter number one, this little pattern right here. So is there a do we download the file? And is it just a trace? Oh, okay. Your file already has the AI file as a template layer. Okay. Just draw right over the top. Of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Every single chapter, every single mini project, and every single chapter has all of the AI files. Literally has all the Illustrator files for you. Um, you just have to use them as a template. Draw okay, right I just over the top of them. Sure that I didn't have to like try to draw this by myself. No, then. no. But I've had people actually save this pillowcase as an image and bring it into Illustrator and just draw the shape shirt over the top of it. So, and I've, I've had other students uh, go in and take the, the Illustrator file, um, take the image, change the opacity, turn okay. the opacity down yeah, a little bit, yeah. put a layer on top of it and draw over the top of it. So whatever you're most comfortable with um, as far as kind of tracing the shape. So yeah, every single mini project already has the Illustrator file oh. and everyone's a template already. It, well, it's a layer template. So you just have to add another layer on top. Okay, uh, so that's chapter one and chapter two gets into Pathfinder tools. Now I'm not gonna go in and kind of break down this entire chapter. Uh, this is very similar practice with the pen tool, but it introduces our Pathfinder. It has some really cool little illustrations and logos in here. This little fire dude with little tiki face. Like there's some cool little digital illustrations. What I like about this book is it's an illustrator that does a lot of graphic illustrations. So you're gonna see pirates and little, uh, little illustrated mascots and little icons you would use on a website for different things. So you'll see anchors and you'll see uh, patterns and textures, but the Pathfinder tool, uh, which is figure 2.9 in your chapter two, is the really important tool. So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to do a digital illustration. We're going to doodle for an hour, hour and a half, just to get the two skills kind of refreshed, kind of rehearsed. We've seen them before, but you might have not have seen them for a while, and that will open up the door for us to do our basic little drawings uh, for our projects. Okay, so I'm going to close out of this book. Uh, the like I said, the, the um, chapter files I attach right here as a zip file. If you're in the lab and you don't have a thumb drive, I'd recommend waiting until you get home to download those because they're about three gigs. They'll probably take a few minutes to download based on the speed of your computer, uh, kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, I did uh, kind of showcase an illustrator who I 
I was introduced to a few weeks ago that I thought had a really cool kind of digital illustration style. Uh, so I try to introduce different styles of illustration uh, based on what we're working on and who I might be introduced to and different things like that. So this is a really cool one if you want to just go look at digital illustrators. You can also Google Digital Illustrators 2023 or you can go to comarts.com, which is communication arts. And in their fresh section, they have Photoshop people and Illustrator people all over the site. So they have some really cool cool one. So I check label designs and packaging design and illustrators and new website designs all on ComArts. It's a really good uh, periodical that kind of stays up to speed on who, what some of the current trends are for 2022 and now 2023. So if you ever just want to nose around and see what's going on, there's some really cool inspirational things inside their fresh section, which they call fresh on the home page but when you click on it, it has a bunch of different links in there uh, so check it out if you're just trying to feed your brain uh, and i also attached uh, a little uh, oreo bird uh, that you need to download to your computer because that's what we're going to doodle on tonight we're going to spend a little time doodling we're going to talk about different styles of drawing uh, i attached an illustrator file of a very graphic uh, oreo bird that i drew for a project uh, that you'll get kind of a look at the style that I like to draw in Illustrator, and we're going to show different styles. So you'll need both of these tonight. We're going to primarily doodle in this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the construction of this, which is my Illustrator file. So you can see how it went from this photo of a bird to the more graphic style, which is how I drew it. Uh, so we'll kind of cover some different styles tonight. Like I said, mine's very graphic, very modern in nature, uh, but many people are more illustrative, more watercolor-ish, more kind of natural and organic, and there's kind of a fit and a fit for everything. So uh, mine's a little bit more for iconography and logo design, but the more natural organic is a little bit more for uh, spot illustration and packaging design and some web development too. So it's just kind of how your visual aspect of what you do, kind of how you process colors and shapes uh, will kind of determine how you do things. So let's download this picture and we're gonna get into Illustrator and we're gonna play around a little bit tonight. We're gonna use paintbrush, pencil, pen tool, the color palette, the swatches, the Pantone colors, and the Pathfinder tool. We'll do a little bit of line width because I want to show you some tricks of different things I do. And we're just going to introduce you to some of those basic skills. If you haven't seen them before, or maybe they might be new to you. And then we'll kind of uh, uh, kind of open the door, kind of show you some things so that you can practice as you're drawing uh, towards your out of book project for this week, which will be your homework. And we'll talk about that after the lecture, after we do a little doodling. Uh, so I saved those two files to my desktop already. I'm going to go into Illustrator. Uh, we're going to create a new document. Uh, let's create a, let's do something custom. So let's just do like eight inch by eight inch. I'm kind of in this square mood right now. Uh, I don't know why I don't like portrait and landscape. I like just to put things symmetrical, kind of more square uh, lately. So I've been doing a lot of illustrations more in a proportionate or scale format, uh, probably because I'm doing a lot more kind of spot illustration and stuff like that or something I need for a website. So we'll go ahead and create an eight by eight. And you'll notice here it is perfectly square. I love that. Uh, so we're in Illustrator, right? And we've seen the toolbar over here before. So we have selection and direct select. We have the pen tools, the shape tools, the paintbrush, the pencil, the type tool, the rotation and scale tool, the eraser tool, all of this stuff, gradient, eye drop, uh, tool, uh, the width tool. Uh, this is to change the artboard or the canvas size, the zoom tool. A lot of things that we've explored before in Graphic Design 1, Graphic Design 2, Visual Communication, any of those classes. So we've touched on them. We know that this is fill. We know that this is stroke. These are our palettes over here, everything from color palettes to the artboard to stroke and alignment and pathfinder and gradient. All of those are found in the window dropdown. So if anywhere in your book, it shows a palette on the right-hand side that doesn't cur currently exist when you have Illustrator open. Remember, you can go to the window dropdown and whatever the name of the palette is, see the little describers right here? That's what they are over here. So if you open up your book and they happen to be using the gradient and you don't have the gradient over here, you go to window, you go down to the dropdown that says gradient and it will add it over here to your palette. I always like to start with the essentials palette. The essentials is basically swatches uh, text tool, uh, paragraph, uh, some of the tints and opacities, 
trans aka transparencies, properties, layers, that sort of thing. I then like to customize mine with the pathfinder, the alignment, the gradient, and uh, that's pretty much a stroke. That's pretty much what I keep down here in my palette whenever I have Illustrator and it remembers it. So when I set it up and then I reopen it, it has my palette pretty much set up the way I like it. A lot of it's because I like to expand my stroke palette. I like to align a lot of things. I cut a lot of things apart. I divide them, I unify them, I break them apart. So I need the Pathfinder tool and gradients are great for creating a visual sense of depth. Uh, gradient mesh is really awesome for that. And that'll be our lecture next week. Um, but Gradient tool is really good because you can do a lot of what appears to be transition of color into a three-dimensional space using the gradient tool. And then you add in things like drop shadows and glows and textures and blurs and all the extra things that appear over here in our effects window, which crosses over into Photoshop effects, uh, makes Illustrator really powerful. I mean, what you can do now as far as depth and transparency and layering an environment that's supposed to be flat 2D design, digital illustration is really awesome in Illustrator. I no longer have to create a drawing in Illustrator, copy it, paste it into Photoshop as a smart object, which is just a scalable vector graphic in essence, and add those effects to it. A lot of them are embedded in Illustrator now, which beg begs the question, if you're a drawer by nature, you're an Illustrator as a visual communicator, you like to do things in scalable drawings, why do you need Photoshop? because a lot of Photoshop effects are now embedded in Illustrator. That's a very good question. I had a designer who was probably 60 years old that worked for me and every single project I tasked him to do for our company, he did an Illustrator. Literally every single thing. Even if it was an advertisement that was supposed to have photos in it, he did an Illustrator because everything that needed an effect he had in Illustrator. So he just imported images in and high resolution created the output level he needed, eight and a half by 11, 11 by 17, 12 by 18. He collaged everything. He did clipping masks. He did everything he needed that was Photoshop based in Illustrator. So Illustrator has come a long way. Gosh, you can't say you can't teach an old dog new tricks because the Illustrator he started with did not have all of these effects. And now Illustrator does, which is kind of nice because if you're just an illustrator, package design, advertising, billboards, logos, if that's what you do as a designer, you in theory could get away with just Illustrator. And now Illustrator has art boards, which means you can make more than one page at a time. So can you design a menu in Illustrator? Yep. Can you do a magazine in Illustrator? Yep. Can you do package design in Illustrator? Yep. Anything you could do in InDesign, can you do it in Illustrator now? Yep. I mean, the tools are starting to cross over. So... I love Illustrator. I use it every single day. I'm doing a digital drawing or a typography solution or something every single day. I just had a client reach out to me and they need a website built that I'm going to do over the weekend because they rent cars with Toro. Toro? That's a thing? They're buying more cars just to rent them. They now own five cars and it's a couple that should only have two cars because they rent them all. I can't even believe it. So there's QR codes to rent their cars and they need a basic web page. and I'm gonna do an illustration for their logo and I'm gonna import their images and I'm gonna build everything for them and upload it so they can have their own LLC page renting their cars that'll all be tied to Toro and they purchased a certain domain name so that if you search for rentable cars, there should come up because the keywords that you would search for for renting a car, they already got the domain name for. So pretty smart on their side. So I touch Illustrator every single day. Okay, so let's get in and talk about the environment of Illustrator, right? Because Illustrator actually is a single layer environment. And I know lots of designers that draw everything on one layer. It doesn't matter how complicated it is, how many things are involved. If there's pictures in the background and illustrations on the top and type on top of that and glows all over everything, they just use one layer literally one layer, which they just name layer one or their drawing layer. That's really not best, that's not best practice. So we're gonna talk a little bit tonight about bringing in photographs, bringing in elements, tracing, in essence, using Illustrator like a light table, getting scale and proportion, using it as a generalized template, from that template creating an original art piece. All of those things can happen in Illustrator, ideally not on one layer. So really break away from that process because uh, it can become a bit of a mess when you bring Illustrator files into a, other Adobe programs, right? You can import Illustrator into InDesign. You can import Illustrator files into Photoshop. 
You can import Illustrator files into uh, InDesign. You can import Illustrator files into After Effects and Premiere video programs, right? Because you would want to do that anyway. You want to bring vector graphics in there to make fireworks explode and do different things if you're making animations. You need to break those apart into layers so that when you import them, they ask you which layers you want to import. Sometimes you might only want type. Sometimes you might only want one particular aspect of the drawing, the line art, the color shapes. So all of those things should be distinctly different. So let's get into now importing in, drawing, doodling, and sketching. Uh, we're gonna spend, like I said, an hour from now to an hour and 15 minutes doing the basic stuff, talking through it, getting a good recorded foundation so that our recording's about an hour and 45 minutes. You can watch it back over and over again during the week, practice as you need to practice. A uh, student last night, I had a class and she was like, I've already watched eight hours of your recording, an hour and a half per chunk over and over and over again as I was practicing something you were talking about. So I found the sweet spot was about an hour and 45 minutes. So we're gonna try to keep it to that. All right, so let's get in here. So we gotta go to file, we're gonna go into place. And we're going to import in our little bird. So wherever you put that thing, we're going to do file place. And you're going to notice when I do file place, I'm going to click and drag before I place so that I make sure my image is just shy of the width of my document, right? So you can do file place and just tap your mouse once. And whatever the resolution size of your image is, is how it will place it. Well, that could be a problem if you downloaded a super high resolution image because it'll make it enormous in your document. If you click and drag, it drags a picture container, like in InDesign, the box with the X that you place pictures into. In essence, clicking and dragging your mouse when you do file place creates the X container from, from InDesign and places the picture only in it. That's really important because we don't want any overflow. You'll actually notice that I do it, didn't do it all the way to the edge of the document either because I don't want to bleed my image, right? Bleed. I could have because this is called the pasteboard over here, this dark gray. So I can actually put elements over there and you would see them, right? Unlike Photoshop, if you put an element outside of the artboard or the canvas in Photoshop, you can't see it. It exists, but the only way you can see it is by turning on the transform box so that it draws a little box around the element that's off the page. Illustrator is totally different. You can use this as a pasteboard. And I actually do use it as a pasteboard. I'll actually draw little color swatches over here for the colors I'm using in my Illustrator. And I keep them over here, which means when I save a PDF, this thing doesn't exist over here. The only thing that exists is what's inside of the border of the document. I, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, like I have like, the blue X over the front of mine. All right, so where's your picture? It's on. I, I placed it. It's all okay, I so when you do file place, make sure that this little link box isn't checked because the way. X is going to create a linked object for you. Thank you for asking because you don't need to link either because once you file place into the canvas size, we want to make sure that the image is embedded. That way we don't need the original photo from the so desktop. Want to link? Yeah, you oh, want it yeah, embedded. Sure. Yeah, you want it embedded. You don't want the blue X. The reason you don't want the blue X, I used to link everything I put in Illustrator to keep my file size down. But now with storage, I save ex everything externally. I don't want to link because once I place that, I can trash the picture on the desktop. I don't need the picture anymore because it's embedded in here. All right, before we go any further, let's save this thing because remember we're running off temporary memory. So you always want to save it so that if any time you have an issue, and this is the best practice for all of Adobe. If ever you have a problem, make sure you save it when you first set up your file because it will restore to last known copy even if you didn't save it. So Illustrator, for if, let's say someone, you know, power went out in your house and your computer booted down and you had to reboot it up and it closed Illustrator and everything. If it reopened Illustrator, it will reopen at the last moment it was open, even if you didn't save it, it will ask you to restore copy and it will restore to anything you've drawn. So we're just going to name it uh, learning module one underscore lecture one underscore your last name. So McElroy for me. And then just save it wherever to the desktop if you're on your computer uh, at home or if you have an external drive plugged in or whatever. And now anything that happens now, we're in good shape, right? These computers wipe themselves every night. They're supposed to, but it's only if they pull the breaker. 
So if this computer never gets booted down at night, then whatever's on the desktop will stay there. I, I can't bring my computer because my Wi-Fi chip broke, so I can only have Ethernet connected. So I have to use this for today. That's fine. So you can just email the file to yourself at the end of the night. So okay. just go into my Hugo and send yourself okay. an email with the file. The file won't be too big, but you can actually bring your laptop in and unhook the Ethernet on the back I of that can? computer okay. I know if I do that and plug it in. My Wi-Fi chip decided to break. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I can only use Ethernet. So, so you can unplug the Ethernet okay, cable from the that back that. of that, or you could steal it from one of the other ones and plug it in. Just remember to plug it back okay, in, the and they'll just tap right mm -hmm. in for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're there. We got it saved, right? Learning module one, uh, lecture one, uh, your last name dot AI. Now also remember that any type we do in our projects, unless we outline the type, any of the elements that you potentially could have linked or any unique things that you might have that are unique to you, uh, make sure that when you're done with your projects, you're saving them as PDFs, right? So before I even go any further, I'm just going to show you where that is, right? File save as Adobe PDF, right? It's all part of this actually is an Illustrator PDF, which means when you save it, it'll actually ask you if you want to keep the layers. Keep the layers, because if you ever share that PDF with someone who doesn't have Illustrator or even has Illustrator, they can open up your PDF and see all of the components that make up your file. It doesn't flatten it. If you don't want them to see the elements that are stacked inside of your file because you don't want them to edit them, when you do save as PDF, you uncheck the layers button and it flattens it so they can't touch it. Uh, I just did an illustration for a t-shirt and the company, the nonprofit I did it for, they didn't have Illustrator. They don't even have a graphic design department uh, or any kind of marketing person whatsoever that's creative. Uh, so I gave them the PDF with the layers because they were dealing with t-shirt companies and they wanted to use it for other things, social media. So I just gave them the layers so that they could remove pieces if they didn't need certain pieces of the thing I drew for them. So that just depends on your client and what you're comfortable with. Now, when I do billable work, I flatten everything, all my Photoshop files, our P flattened PDFs, all my illustration files, my InDesign file, everything is a PDF they can't edit because I own what I created for them and they are paying me for my final output. I don't want them to take those pieces and use them for other things. So if it's billable work and it's not a nonprofit, I'm just doing work for, I flatten everything. So just kind of a best practice, right? If they paid me for a poster design, I'm gonna give them what they need to produce that poster, but I'm not gonna give them the layers so that they can separate the elements and use it on their website, separate elements and use it for a billboard. If they want things for their website, they can pay me for it and I will remove the pieces they need and output it in another media type for them to be able to do whatever they want to do for their next thing. Okay, so we have our global selection arrow, the black selection tool selected. We're going to pick the bird here. We're going to go over to our properties menu and we're going to turn the opacity down on our bird. And we're just using the bird as a template. I'm just going to show you different ways to draw in perspective, in scale, in proportion, a way to give you in essence a sketch of what you might then want to create something in your own style or likeness. It's the same as if you were in art school and you were doing figure drawing and there was a model and they gave you the little wooden figure that has the little bendable arms and legs and you bend the little figure to the kind of the position that your model might be in and you kind of doodle the framework based on the skeleton or the little wooden figurine that they give you, the little wooden model. And then you take that perspective that you bent to the position that you doodled, and then you did your finished sketch of whatever model was there. It's the same concept. We're using found objects to get scale, proportion, kind of how things look, and then we're creating our own unique style elements on top of it. Uh, sometimes I'll be doing something for someone and they'll be looking for something out of perspective. And so I'll be like, well, I'm going to sketch in my sketchbook the face of something. And then I'm going to go look at something else and I'm going to kind of sketch uh, a different part of the, uh, let's say it was a, I don't know, it was a pirate. And I might be doodling a pirate head or something on my iPad or doing it on my sketchbook. And then I might, you know, go look for 
or I might have a model or I might take a photo of someone in some perspective, something I wanted. I'll doodle their body a little bit. I might go look for some different hand uh, textures, features, kind of proportions. I'll doodle sketch a little bit of those and I'll bring all those elements together and I'll make my sketch, which is what we're gonna do tonight. And then I'm only gonna use that as my template and I'm gonna use my pen tool or whatever tool I'm most comfortable with in Illustrator and do my finished artwork. So I'm kind of using my sketchbook, whether it's digital or manual, just to gather elements of proportion scale kind of how I want things maybe the angle of the camera that kind of thing but I'm using it just like I would use my regular sketchbook I was if I was out in real life and I was sketching something oh I want to do a drawing of uh I don't know a wild bird and I was walking behind the path today and there was this huge blue heron that was like kind of scoping some uh, fish in the water. And I'm looking at it real quick. I snap picture of it on it. Later, I'm gonna kind of doodle a little bit over the top of it. I would use that perspective of the bird that I saw and I would doodle over the top of it. And I would go in and do a really graphic illustration of a blue heron that I might need for an illustration of some kind. Or uh, I do a lot of work for the Everglades Wonder Garden. Maybe they need something with a blue heron or something. So I kind of use that to get perspective, real world stuff. And then from there, I create my own personality based on that. But sometimes it's hard to know how big the beak is on a certain bird or, you know, uh, a certain perspective of someone reaching their arm out without the little wooden model. And that's what Disney animators do. They come up with characters and they make actual clay figurines of the characters and then they bend those figurines into different perspectives and that's how they sketch they literally sketch based on models that were sculpted based on the concept of a character so that they get the right perspective right so i'm just doing it digitally versus doing it in a real world still life kind of setting so it's a really good way even if you're not comfortable with perspective and scale and proportion a really good way to make sure that you kind of have things kind of the right way before you uh, go in and kind of apply your own style to it. Okay, so we got our image. We kind of have the opacity of at about 50% is what I like to give a general watermark. So you can see the scale of the beak. You can see the eye, the head. You can see the transition of color. See how it's not symmetrical and it kind of has feather tucks and it has some interesting patterns and notice how the shapes taper back on his wing they're kind of smaller shapes here and they get a little bit bigger as they curve back this could actually be an arc warp what's called an arc warp inside of illustrator uh, we're going to do effects next week so we're just going to talk about sketching in perspective this week, and then we'll deal with some of the effects that can really help you out. You can actually do these shapes flat and then do things like arc warps, and you can stretch it out, skew it, and you can get this perspective by drawing an absolutely flat shape. So, uh, And we'll look at that next week as we introduce different effects in Illustrator. Uh, okay, so we have that done. Our image is kind of our watermark here. I'm going to do Command Plus just to zoom in a little bit. So here's our little bird dude here, right? Command plus, short key commands are really important for me. I do a lot of that different kinds of stuff. Um, you'll notice with nothing selected inside of my document, my properties window changes to the property settings for my document. This little box right down here is really important. Scale, stroke, and effects, which means if we add a two point stroke to any shape and we draw it, really itty bitty like size of a stamp and we scale it up to the side of even a business card it will stay that thickness based on how big we make it that's a really important box to be checked it's not always checked which drives me crazy when you open up a new document and then students will do things like drop shadows and stroke effects and things like that and they'll scale it up and they'll be like why does it look itty bitty now when it was super thick when i drew it really small well it was super thick when you drew it really small because it was six point at 0.25 inches but when you make the 0.25 inches, seven inches, that thing isn't very thick. It becomes like hairline thin. So just make sure you have that. It's also embedded in the transform settings of a document too. Uh, if you open up the transform palette, it's in the little three line detail there because it's part of the transform effects. Uh, but you can find it here by deselecting everything. Okay, let's go into the layers. Uh, we're gonna name this uh, photo temp for photo template. We're going to add a new layer. We're going to lock the photo template layer and the 
new layer is going to called sketch. Now we're going to do multiple layers because we're going to talk a little bit about best practices as it relates to evolving your sign of design. So let's say someone hires you and they're like, we want you to do a children's book. And the children's book is going to be all about a little kid and him sharing his lunch with his classmates, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be eight pages. Um, you know what most people do? Most illustrators do? They have a kid stage out the eight pages. They take a photograph of the kid staging out the eight pages. They take those photos. They either doodle on them. They use them as perspective and draw on the computer based on them, or they watermark them, do a doodle sketch over the top, and then go back layer, later and do the actual style of drawing, which is their finished artwork or their inking in of their finished drawing. So this is the exact same process we're doing all the way back to traditional drawing animators all the way forward to today's digital illustration. So hopefully I've kind of eased a little bit of the nervousness of drawing because uh, you don't have to be a drawing artist to be really good at vector graphics. You don't have to be at all. The most you have to be is creative because you got to think about what you want to do and then figure out the digital application of it based on what you want to do. Uh, I have another buddy of mine who does photorealistic painting and he's like old school and he takes his camera out and he photographs a panoramic image of the thing he wants to paint and he tapes all the photos together after he prints them because he doesn't know how to shoot widescreen and then he draws on the canvas based on the series of, he has a tripod that clicks. It has positions, click, 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 click. And he takes six photos as he clicks the tripod around. He goes to CVS, prints the six pictures out, takes a piece of mat, what they call magic tape, which is the tape they sell at the art stores and AC Moore and stuff like that. It's clear tape. Uh, and he tapes the images together, overlaps them so they look seamless, which I can do in Photoshop in three seconds. Um, and then he draws on top of that or he paints based on that collage that he photographed. It's like the craziest thing. And then he uses a super high resolution camera. He takes a picture of his tiny little three inch by eight inch painting, which is photorealistic. You can literally see every grain of sand on his beach photos that he paints. Uh, and then he prints them and blows them up and sells them as limited edition prints. So there's lots of ways to use imagery as inspiration, even for painters, even for photorealistic painters. So just keep that in mind as we're kind of doing this process. Okay, so we got our little birdie in there. We have our photo template, right? It's locked, so we can't touch it, which is really important because it's going to be our watermark. And I also made sure that I put it in a spot there, kind of in the center of my document when I did file place, gave it a little bit of a crop so it isn't bleeded all the way to the edge, bled all the way to the edge. And uh, I locked it. So now we have our sketch layer. Now, we spent a lot of time in the first few graphic design classes talking about the pen tool. The pen tool is really important. And the pen tool is actually how I do all of my graphic illustrations. Once I do a little bit of a Google, kind of a doodle sketch, so I get scale and proportion and basic things. And you'll actually notice from my drawing and a lot of drawings I do that I actually don't necessarily stay in proportion in the end, but I use it as a guiding force before I get in and start stretching things and doing different things for them. Okay, so here he is. Uh, here's my little Oriole bird. Um, I'm from Maryland. This is the state bird. And so with springtime, I was like, oh, earlier your bird. We'll do something like that. And I had to do a little icon for someone who lives in Maryland and has a business. So uh, I figured it was a good project to do because I had just done a digital illustration like in the last week uh, for a finished piece. So, okay. All right. So we spent a lot of time in the pen tool. Uh, we're going to start actually, uh, we can start in the pencil tool. So the pencil tool is a really great tool for just getting like a pencil drawing like you would do in your sketchbook to give you scale and proportion, a basic idea of what we have going on here. You'll notice my fill. Uh, I like the blackout fill and stroke, so it doesn't matter what tool I'm using. I have it blacked out because I'm going to gray it out too when all is said and done, but it just gives me a little bit of perspective as I'm doodling and drawing. Uh, and remember, we're on our sketch layer. We aren't on our photo temp layer. So please make sure you have a second layer and you have the photo layer locked because what I use 
the pencil tool for is to give me scale and proportion. And in essence, a just a sketch line art of what I'm going to be created as my finished artwork. Uh, I'm gonna go over and make sure that my stroke weight isn't that heavy. Uh, we'll select it and change the scale and everything as we draw, just so you can see the different ways I deal with different shapes based on what I'm drawing. It's kind of the same as in putting the pen down and pushing it a little harder if you're drawing on a piece of paper or maybe shading the line more than one time. If you're kind of doodle sketching, if you like to sketch, all I'm doing is it digitally using the weight, stroke weight or line weight tool inside Illustrator. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw some shapes that represent the beak. And you're gonna notice, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I'm just doing a basic little location. So I'm gonna draw his eyeball, right? So you're gonna see really quickly that I'm just getting an outline of the bird character. And I use the space bar a lot because the space bar will let me pan around the picture. So depending on what my comfort level is for how far I'm zoomed in, I can always pan across. And the reason I use the pencil tool is because it allows me the opportunity to just kind of free form shapes. So you'll notice I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to get the perspective of this bird, kind of what his wing shape is, kind of where the shape of things are, but I'm not going to get too detailed into all of the shape shapes. Like, so you see all these little things in his feathers, like kind of these white shapes. I'm just going in and creating some texture. This would be just like if I was sketching before I any did any finished work in my sketchbook. So I like to just go in and create some basic shapes to dictate the bird and his textures. And so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and I'm actually gonna hide the Photoshop layer for just a second so you can see I'm just getting scale and proportion. Right, I'm just getting scale and proportion just so that I can make sure that, and you also notice I'm not doing a great job at all the shapes. I'm literally just getting an idea for color break, where things separate, how long his tail is, like his hand, his general hand shape. And I'm doing the outline, right? So I'm starting with the outline. And then I might go in and kind of do a few details. And remember, this is just a template sketch. I'm just doing the basics to kind of get this thing started. It doesn't have to be perfect. I am just creating the general shape. But if the hair is smooth, I try to do this hair smooth. If there's a tuck in the hair, which you can see right here, where the hair goes behind the leg and has this little groove here. I do add that in my doodle because I need that for shapes when I'm doing my finished artwork. So you'll notice that I'm doing some basic shapes based on where they are in perspective to the body, but not super detailed. My pencil tool keeps like trying to that's because it has a smart smooth. Can I turn that So off? it can always I, has a smart smooth. I, so I'm trying to like do an outline, but like if I even touch the other line, it joins them together and gets rid of half of it. So when you draw your sketch, you do the outline. And then what I do is I go back and forth between shading towards the top and shading towards the bottom. So I'm not touching my lines that are overlapping. You know what I mean? Because there is smart smoothing and it has a one point smooth. So it's smoothing the line as we go. So it is going to happen. So like I drew this foot, I'm just gonna draw a little line up there, little line here. I'm gonna draw a little wiggle for the shape. And also notice I am zoomed in a little bit. So I'm not right on top of all the lines that I'm drawing. I am getting it a little separation there. But actually the line smoothing is a good thing because it gives you a more natural kind of pen bleeding line as you're drawing because it kind of gives that smoothness to you. So you'll notice that I am just kind of following the hair of this thing and creating my basic shape. And I'm gonna zoom in 
I'm missing a foot here and I'm just getting some basic detailed work in and I'm using the pencil tool, but I could have also used, and I'm gonna draw a little bit of the branch too. I don't know if I'm gonna need the branch, but I'm gonna doodle it for perspective just so if I need to use, I have it there. Just looking real quick if I want to add any of the little branches. Remember, this is just a quick little sketch. And the beauty about the pencil is you can just use your mouse and drag, drag it a little bit. And I'm not giving a lot of detail. You can see from mine, I'm just shading a few lines where the feathers in the tail separate. It's kind of like if you ever use the clone tool in Photoshop where you just kind of work around the space, the content aware fill just to kind of give yourself anywhere I think I see kind of some basic texture changes. And you'll see my little doodle sketch. Hey, if that was in my sketchbook, I'd be pretty proud of that. I was sitting there and there was a bird out in the distance and I was just doodling a little sketch of the bird. And just to kind of re-emphasize, you'll see little things like where I see a little bit of change in the feathers where his body curves down here. He's got a little wiggle in his feathers here. There's a long separation of feathers in the tail. So I drew a couple of straight lines. You'll notice that the fingers there were a couple of spots where I saw the nail. I just kind of chopped it off a little bit. So I knew that he had kind of some elongated talons kind of in his fingers, a little bit sharper. Just to get the basic idea. So if you see, and I tell all the students, like if I was to print this in grayscale on just a generic old printer, uh, you would see some shades of gray, some differences in the photo based on shades of gray. And some people say, when you squint your eyes and you kind of see the blurriness of the shapes, if you see distinctly different shapes, that's a good place to doodle lines a little bit, just so that you know in your brain that that was where there was a color change or a good place to introduce a new shape or something like that. And I'm actually seeing a little bit of a wrinkle maybe in his kind of crown area. So I'm just doing a couple of little sketches here um, just to kind of get an idea for feathers and texture and things like that. And this is my sketch layer, right? This is where my kind of foundation for what I'm gonna do now later. Now, some digital illustrators will actually use this as a really rough sketch that they'll take a paintbrush or a pencil over with a thicker line and make a more on purpose line based on you know, what they used as their kind of template. So I'm gonna show that style first because that's not the style I do, but for some people for realism purposes and for organic and natural sketching, they are most comfortable kind of in this process. Remember, I'm a more graphic, so I'm gonna actually use the pen tool and create some really purposeful, smooth graphic shapes that you would see in like a logo or an icon of some kind or something in packaging that's a very distinct shape, very graphic shape. But lots of illustrators, like I showed you in the announcement section, have a very much an illustration style. So they'll use an environment, they'll use a a sketch technique like this, they'll doodle, and then they'll go in with a thicker paintbrush and they'll actually create some more permanent shapes. So once I have my doodle sketch done, I'm gonna turn off of my photo so I can't see it, right? 
So it's locked, but I can't see it anymore. So this is all I can see. This is, was my inspiration. This was just my basic doodle sketch. Got my bird, got his legs, got the change in color. I do know that his body's orange and his back is black. So I kind of know the basics now, what I'm doing. Uh, his eyeball, right, has a couple of circles, but we kind of know that from uh, from us, right? You kind of have that outline, then you kind of have that pupil in there, then you have that little highlight inside the pupil. So I kind of know that from drawing animals and people a million times. So I get the basic idea. So once I have my sketch layer, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add a new layer. And I'm going to call it final line. So final line. So you can do final underscore line. This is my finish line for what I'm doing, right? This is my finish line. So I'm only using the doodle sketch now as my kind of foundation for my finish line. So now some digital illustrators, they like to now go in and with like either their pencil a little bit thicker or the paintbrush tool and do a finish drawing, a finish shape for each of their lines, right? Because a lot of digital illustrators, a lot of illustrations that are digital, have outlines and then colors inside of outlines. So think of all the cereal boxes, think of all the packaging designs. I don't know if you go to World Market and you see kind of the fancy organic soaps and stuff they package. All of those labels are vector graphics. They are outline shapes with colors on the inside. That's how they're created, right? They're outline shapes with colors on the inside. So one way to tackle this is to create a detailed final outline and color the shape inside of it, right? final detailed outline, color shape inside of it. So we're just gonna kind of do the beginning of his head in this style and a little bit of his beak in this style. And then we're gonna move on to a different style, which is much more of a purposeful pen tool drawing, more graphic style. So you can see the difference between organic illustration and a little bit more what I would consider graphic visual style of drawing. Both of which translate very well, right? T-shirts, uh, billboards, packaging, anything you can think about that's scalable, graphics. Uh, you go to a pizza parlor and there's a little pizza dude tossing a pie in the air and that's the symbol part of their logo. That can be done a couple of different ways, more graphic or it could be a doodle illustration, a little bit more organic. Either way, it prints for the sign fine, prints on the boxes fine, does fine, right? It's perfectly fine. Um, it's a kind of what visually is a style and you can blend styles too. You can do some loose drawing and more detailed work. Like the eyeball ideally is a shape tool, which is much more of a purposeful graphic shape than to just color it in with a paintbrush in Illustrator, but it's a style, right? So we're gonna look at a couple of different. So now that I have that, I'm gonna lock my sketch layer because my sketch layer is literally my sketch layer. It's not meant to be finished. It's supposed to be my doodle before I take it to the next step. And just remember this organic style of illustration started with a sketchbook. The sketchbook then got penned over. The penned over then got filled in with color. So we're doing the same style that you would do naturally, organically on paper. We're just doing it digitally. Sketch with a pencil, pen it in with ink, because you know that artists used to sketch with a pencil, then draw it in with ink or paint and erase the pencil part of the sketch, or they use tissue paper, lay tissue paper over the pencil sketch and ink it in over the top, making a more permanent line based on their doodle sketch to start, right? And then that's why they call them thumbnail sketches and they evolve from there into finished artwork. So we're doing all those more organic styles, multiple pieces of paper, different types of tools. We're doing it all in Illustrator, just using the tools that Illustrator has. And the pencil is really great for a doodle sketch, just like a number two. And then either a thicker pencil is more like a ballpoint or drawing ink pen or a paintbrush, which is AKA like using an acrylic paint or something with a paintbrush doing the exact same styles. Okay, so we know the beak in this bird has kind of this tapered beak. I didn't do a great job tracing it, but you know what? I was just drawing it, kind of doodle sketching it uh, with a little kind of breathing hole. It's got a little tuck in its beak here. Uh, so my final outline could be done uh, a couple of different ways, right? So you have the pencil tool, the pencil tool that we could go in and thicken our stroke. So, right, so my pencil tool is one point by nature, and that's what one point looks like, right? It's like a sketch with a number two pencil. If I was going in over the top, like comic artists do, they sketch first and then they do what's called inking in the drawing, which means they use a heavier pen tip 
whether it's a quill or a, a, a not a Sharpie, but like a big style of more permanent ink. Sometimes they use a paint marker and they draw in over the top and they do what's called the outlining. And then they have a coloring person or a fill person that comes in and fills the color. So this is a kind of a three-step process, sketch, ink in, colorize. Uh, and so we're gonna do that in uh, Illustrator. All right, so a uh, couple of different ways. So we can use our standard old pencil. We can thicken the weight of it. So I'm gonna draw a line real quick, just so that you can see that this is much thicker, right? So I'm gonna do Command Z or undo. Uh, so three points a little aggressive maybe. So maybe I go down to two point. Now, something you should know about drawing with the line, see that line right there? It has a cap, an end cap on it, which is chopped off currently. So if I use my selection tool and deselect, see that thing's a little chopped off right there? I'm gonna delete that. I'm gonna go back to my pencil tool. When I'm doodling in an organic nature, I like to end cap it round. And you'll notice the difference when I draw this, it has a nice big pen release point at the end of the line. So you'll see it's curved right there. The reason that's important is because when I expand my lines, which means makes my line shapes, that round becomes a shape. So it's really nice to have the round cap, uh, but it's a style, right? So some of these things you're gonna see as we're doing, you can mess around with the properties, the stroke weights, the details of this thing based on the style that you're doodling in. So I've got two points, I've got a rounded cap and I have uh, my stroke being black, right? My stroke is black. My properties over here in my layers, right? My sketch layer right here, here it is, right? I have all that preset. I'm gonna turn off my, uh, I'm gonna lock my sketch layer and I'm gonna go into my final art layer. So now with my, pencil tool, maybe my style, right? All I needed the photo was for scale and proportion. But I understand that a bird's beak curves and it has more of a V shape. So even though I doodle sketch loosely and I just kind of got the basic shape, scale of this thing based on the size of his head and everything else, uh, maybe my style is the way I see things is to smooth this thing out. Maybe it's to make it a little bit bigger. Maybe it's to introduce some uh, personality to my original sketch, just to kind of bring it to life my own way. So maybe I would go in now and take this and flatten it out, create the tip, bring it around, and I'm gonna tuck in the shape like the bird beak should be, right? Because that's a little bit more traditional of shape for the bird. And I'm actually gonna turn off the sketch for a second. So you can see that's like a really smooth shape, much smoother than the other doodle sketch, right? There's the doodle sketch. Beak looks a little haphazard, right? I just doodled it real quick. You ever seen an illustrator out in the real world with a sketchbook and he's doing some scenes? The sketches are so loose and so quick that things like a beak detail would look like the weirdest little shape, right? So that's all I did. I just did a quick little sketch so that I can make sure that I have a better interpretation of the shape. Now, you will notice that the beak was separated with a line. So, but you see how my line went over top of the other line and it's not really, um, I can't see it all that well, the separation. Sometimes I'll go in and turn off my sketch layer and draw my second line to separate the beak with the sketch layer covered. So now you can see that the beak has a separating line, just like the sketch layer, but I hid the sketch layer. And you'll notice why I hid the sketch layer, because you see the other beak line, it was like right where my sketch line already was. So I hid the layer. Remember, it's already locked, so I'm not moving it just so that I could draw over the top. So I'm gonna keep going, right? Just so that you can see my practice, I'm gonna draw the circle. Now I could use the circle tool, right? I could use the circle tool in the shape tool and draw a perfect circle, but that's not the style I'm doing. I'm doing a looser, more organic drawing that needs me to not be perfect with all my shapes. I don't want all my shapes to be perfect because I'm doing a more organic version 
of what I'm trying to do here. And so I'm gonna hide my sketch and I'm gonna deselect. And now you can really see that my beak has much more purpose, right? It's much smoother line. Remember, you can always do Command Z if you don't like the shape. You can always use the selection tool and select some line you don't like and hit delete. But you also notice even the line separating the beak has a nice rounded curve to it, has a nice rounded curve to it. So my lines are getting much better. My shapes are getting much better. So they look totally different than my sketch lines. If I hide my final detailed line, you can see that it's like barely a beak, but my finish line, the hole for the breathing is a much better hole. The line here, but separating is, has more purpose. Now I will tell you, I steadied my mouse hand a little bit and I didn't do such a loose do -do 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 like I was doing on the sketch. And I purposefully drew the line a little bit slower. Now, thankfully the line properties of it has it kind of giving me a nice taper to it, a nice texture to it. Uh, now, there are things like the width tool and expanding my lines and doing things to really enhance what I'm doing here. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about effects and expanding things and doing things like that, enhancing our illustrations. But for tonight, we're just doing a lecture on basic drawing. Okay. So I'm gonna do the head just so that we can get the basic idea of this bird. Um, so you'll notice next is the eyeball, right? And I'm actually gonna command plus, zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna hold the space bar down and I'm gonna kind of move my, my artboard around a little bit because I wanna center the eye. If I turn the photo back on, you'll notice my drawing of the eye kind of missed the boat a little bit. Like look at where it is compared. So I know the backside of this is about where the eye should be and it's a little better circle. So I'm gonna use my pencil tool again, and I'm gonna draw a little better. I'm gonna be a little more purposeful in the drawing of my circle. So now you'll notice that I did a little better job with the eye of the bird. So I'm being a little bit more slower, patient, purposeful, and I am using the pencil tool. So everything is based on my hand right, whether it's the mouse or a pencil, uh, a tablet pencil or stylus or something like that. I mean, I'm being much more purposeful, but I did by happy accident, get really close to the size of the eyeball in the photo. All I did was kind of guesstimate the location and be a little bit smoother with how I drew the eyeball. And you'll notice there is a little pupil in there. So I'm gonna hide my photo and I'm gonna use the pencil again and I'm gonna do a basic little shape that could be my pupil and hide my doodle sketch, deselect, and you can start seeing what's going on here. So a much more purposeful shape to my bird. Now, I'm gonna turn the photo layer back on just so that you can see that his head, in essence, is this top black shape. So the head is basically this top black shape. So that's the only thing I'm gonna create as a shape goes so that we can do the basics of the sketch of this bird. So I'm only gonna do the top of his head. So now I'm gonna use my pencil again, right? It's thicker, it's a thicker stroke than my sketch. I'm gonna go a little bit more patiently around and you'll actually notice his head has a much smoother arc to it. I turn the photo layer on and the head has a much smoother arc to it. So when I do my drawing, I'm gonna give this guy a little bit smoother of a head. So I'm just gonna naturally go around a little bit smoother, All right? This is practice too. You can do Command Z and undo it. And then I'm just gonna do a couple of lines here to kind of show where his feathers And so I'm just kind of finishing his head. And I'm actually gonna hide the sketch so you can see that here is a much better drawing of the bird head and beak than my sketch layer. Like I spent the time to do a better, a little more organic, 
drawing than my doodle sketch here. So I have perspective. I got a basics for the shape of this thing. You'll notice there is an interior kind of feather shape to where his head kind of changes color a little bit. I like to include that in my final penning or inking of my drawing, even when I'm doing a little more organic because that is where my color changes. Now, it does have a little bit of the feather jaggedness to it. And so I'm gonna introduce that when I do my final pen drawing here. You're gonna notice that I am using the general shape, but I'm giving it a little bit more of a jagged feel. And you can already see that this actually looks far better proportioned than my original sketch of the bird's head. It's smoother, has a little more detail to it. A little better drawing than my sketch. Like this feels much more organic. It's a better penning or dark lining of your proportion of beak breathing hole, eyeball, kind of reflective pupil, uh, the neck feather and kind of the extension of his neck. So if I turn the photo back on, but I keep my sketch doodle out of it, you can see that it is pretty proportioned. The shape of what I have going on is a little more accurate to the bird head than it was in my sketch. And so I bounce back and forth between my two locked layers, which is my sketch layer and my photo template with my final line turned on so that I can get a little bit better idea of what I have going on in my drawing. And so you'll notice that the eye's black with a little white pupil here and, uh, and the beak kind of has this grayness to it with some detailed lines, some black lines in it. The neck, the head is black, but it's really shades of some gray in with the black. But I have the basic head here, right? Like I have the basic idea here. I'll turn the sketch back on for a minute so you can see the head. And I'm only doing the head to show you a more organic way to illustrate uh, or more organically, more naturally, kind of more like a pen and ink style or a watercolor style where you pen something in and then you watercolor it. Or sometimes a more organic watercolor style of artist will actually watercolor it in and then ink it after they watercolor it. So they use their sketch layer and they add their next layer as a color colorizing layer and they color in the shapes and then they go on top of it and they add their ink line, their darkening line, their final line on top of it. It's a process. It's kind of getting comfortable drawing, like what is natural, what naturally works best for you when it comes to your sketching or your drawing. So I'm just showing you a style. Like if I'm creating an organic spot illustration for something for a client, this is how I do it. Whether I take a photo, whether I just go out in the world and go to whatever the object is or the thing I'm working on, or I use some photo libraries in order to get some basic scale and proportion, whatever it is to get my sketch drawn in a way that I can introduce color and line art, final line art. So uh, this is just one way to be a little bit more organic. Okay, so I have just the head of my final line art. So I have the basic sketch here. I'm actually happy with it. It looks like a pretty good head. The beak is good. The basic detail line is good. I rounded off my pen lines. So you get the basic idea. I need this to be gray. I need his head to be some shades of grays and blacks and I need the eyeball to be basically black with a dot in it, uh, a little uh, pupil in it. Now, uh, the line art, the beauty about the line art is when I go in to draw my eye, I might wanna delete the final line of the pupil so that you only see the white. Once I ink in, the beauty about digital illustration is unlike normal illustration that you're doing on pen and paper is that I can remove or add lines as I need to as I evolve my line art and my colorizing art. Now, we're not, we're not dealing with textures, gradients, 
any effects or enhanced elements. We're just line, doing finished line art and colorizing our line art, whether it be more organic or more modern graphic in nature. So um, now we're just gonna go in and add a little bit of color so you can see the process. Now, a couple of things to talk about as it relates to color. Now, when you're doing things graphically, things for logos, things that are one, two, three color process in nature, you should be using Pantone colors. And those are, imagine it's going to Home Depot or Lowe's and picking out paint to paint some wall in your house. And you go and say, I want vivid white or I want a, a sea mist green, right? And they take that they take that swatch and they flip it over and it has a CMYK mixture and they bring out a can of white paint and they enter in the numbers in the machine and it drips the amount of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black it needs into the paint. And then it puts it into a little shaker machine and it shakes that paint. And what it spits out is that sea mist green, right? That is, a, in essence, a Pantone color. That is a pre-mixed color that's exactly the same no matter where you output it around the world. Everyone knows Pantone 285 is dark blue. That's an important part of the process in design if you're making a graphic reproduction, something you're printing on paper and you need to do a color separation, meaning printing in multiple color ranges, or uh, you're producing something that you want to pull color out of to produce something else. So let's say you did an illustration of a bird and you use four different colors that were Pantone colors and they wanted to make that bird a cookie jar. Well, guess what? They would paint the clay of the cookie jar the same color as the color they used to print for the packaging design. So Pantone colors are really important. If you're doing a more organic drawing style where they're just printing in a four color environment, then you can blend colors that aren't necessarily Pantone colors. So if I was coloring this bird in and I was using it for a logo and it was only gonna be three colors or four colors, I would go into my swatch library and I would open up my Pantone color library. If you've never done this before, this is a really important part of the process. If you're doing graphic design, and you're using those colors for branding purposes, meaning this just isn't an illustration for a particular package. This is part of the company's brand. All companies use Pantone colors and Pantone colors can be found in the swatch library. So if you click on the swatches tab, you click on your three little lines, you go into your swatch library. It is called a color book. And think about when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you go in and you have all those swatch cards there. They actually have a big, what's called a fan of colors that they can open up behind the counter. And it's just the rows of all the colors and all the tints of those colors. Those are called color books. And inside the color book, you have what are called Pantone colors. These are the universal color libraries when you're using color for graphic design. C for coded, U for uncoated, and all of these have a corresponding cyan, magenta, yellow, and black combination. Now, based on what the output is for the client might be what the difference is I choose in my Pantone color book library. If I know that it's going to be pastel in nature, if I know they want to use some neon colors or metallic inks, or I know that they're going to print everything organically, so they're never going to use a piece of paper that has a coating on it which is solid coated or CMYK coated. Uh, they're gonna print everything like Whole Foods. They print it on organic paper. Everything's a little bit muted. They run it through. They don't have any, any veneer on the paper, any coating on the paper. Means when you fold the paper, it cracks, right? That's a coating on the paper. Uh, lots of organic companies, they all use uncoated. Lots of more, uh, what I would consider corporate environments that aren't as green or organic in nature, they use coated paper, something that has a clear coating on it. Uh, that does dictate the color I choose because there is more saturation in the color when it's put on uncoated because the paper absorbs the ink more. When the ink is printed on coated, it means that there is a veneer or shine on it and you don't need as much of the color saturation because the shine kind of holds the color. So 
we're doing an organic drawing. So we're going to go in the uncoated environment. Now, do I want to use the standard can of solid uncoated colors, reds, yellows, greens, blues, blacks, grays? I stay in my solid environment. If I want to choose all of the ranges of Pantone colors over the years, the color of the year, that is in the CMYK uncoated environment because those are all the, these are the colors we've mixed over the years that have become standard that people use in their designs. And I don't know if you know this, but Pantone introduces a color of the year every single year. And it's some shade of a CMYK coded or uncoated color that represents whatever the color is of the year. Maybe it's sea mist blue or it's whatever olive green, whatever the thing is for the year, which is funny because the Pantone color of the year traditionally goes along with what interior designers use lots of times for the color palette inside of houses as well. So you'll see shades of colors that are really popular in advertising because they're also popular in interior spaces that people are kind of getting comfortable with. Right, so olives and stuff were really popular during COVID because everyone was stuck inside and they wanted their house to feel like it was outside. So they painted everything green, right? That's kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, so I traditionally stay in CMYK uncoated and solid uncoated because a lot of what I do right now is very organic in nature, just paper wise. No one's printing shiny things anymore. They want everything to look weathered and worn and used because that makes people think it's personal. So I tend to stay in the CMYK uncoated or the solid uncoated. For the sake of the process, I'm gonna do CMYK uncoated just because I want access to all of these colors that exist in the uncoated environment. And you'll actually notice when I move my mouse over the colors, these codes are very important. All of these codes are the codes that printers use in order to color match the CMYK color range of what you have picked. So if you are doing things graphically for a client to build a brand awareness, you wanna stay in the Pantone color environment because these Pantone colors have corresponding CMYK numbers, which means they also have corresponding hex numbers, which is what you use for web and multimedia design. So if I pick a shade of bronze, this little shade here, 23P uncoated, it's Pantone processed uncoated, which is what those numbers and letters stand for, which means they know it is a CMYK mixture for uncoated paper, that number, then we have a CMYK mixture. Now, the beauty is, is that CMYK mixture also has a corresponding hex number, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So if you're building color palettes for brands, you wanna to try to stay in the Pantone color environment. If you're doing organic illustrations, patterns, things that are just part of a campaign or a media thing, then you can do more of a pick your color through the color spectrum because the four color process will print it fine. The only difference is when you don't pick Pantone colors and you just use the standard spectrum color eyedropper to pick, you could get some shading differences, tinting differences based on the printing of it because you're going to get percentages of those colors. So CMYK will have some percentages of cyan, magenta, percentages of yellow, percentages of black. So it could be like 23.15% black. Well, you have to know that what whatever the output is, they're going to round that up or round that down based on how well the output happens, right? The Pantone colors are in essence pouring paint. They're doing more of a very stringent process, screening of it, so the color stays a little bit more accurate in nature. So I'm just going to pick this little bronze color. I'm going to go to my fill. And I'm going to pick this little bronze color, and you're going to notice that it shows it in my color spectrum, my Pantone color. So the one I picked from my Pantone library is appearing right over here. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, which is what I always do, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, and I'm gonna take my re rectangular tool and I'm just gonna draw a box. And the reason I do my rectangular tool and draw a box is because these become little swatch boxes for me when I'm drawing. So I'll draw one and drop it in over there. If I'm being very OCD for the day, I'll hold down shift and draw a perfect square because that way I know these are perfect little paint swatches that I can drop in over there. Now, you may or may not know that it also adds it to your swatches palette. So right over here, you'll see 
that my swatches palette now has my Pantone color added to my swatches library. That's a really important thing. The reason I draw a little swatch over here is that if I ever have to reference it later for a client, I can actually share those swatches with them. So if they don't have Illustrator, they can still replicate the color by sampling from the color. So I'm a bit old school in that way that I keep kind of sample colors around just so that they have what they need if they're drawing now or sampling from for any solution. Now I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna tuck the palette over here so it's under my other palette. So if I need it now, I know my uncoated colors are over there. Now, you'll also know that the beak was grayish gold and everything else was some shade of black. Now, you should know that your standard palette includes the percentage tinting of black to white. It's right down here. So I'm not gonna pull a Pantone color because this is a percentage of black right here. And pure black, 0, 0, 0, 100, is in essence a safe color, a Pantone color. So when I draw and scribble and do some different things, I in essence have one Pantone color and then I have the other color is pure black with some percentage of tint, 90% all the way down to white, which is uh, has a 0%, right? So now I have my bird, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and I need to go into my layers now and I'm gonna add a new layer and I'm gonna lock my line layer. And I'm going to name this colorize or color. And this is my colorize layer. And I'm going to take my colorize layer and I'm going to drag it just below my line layer. So you just click and drag it, right? Drag it up, drag it down. And so my color layer is sitting just underneath my line layer. That's really important because I want to use my lines as kind of like a detail to kind of follow the shapes, right? So the first thing I have to do is I'm going to now switch to my paintbrush. And here is my paintbrush. And I'm going to scribble over here real quick so you could just see what is going on here. See this nice thick line here? So when I scribble, this nice thick line here. So I'm going to switch by hitting my toggle switch and make my paintbrush my Pantone color. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I'm using my paintbrush which currently is set up with the same, well, it's got one point, so let's get in and boost this thing up a little bit. So I'm gonna boost it up to two. So I'm just gonna, all I did was draw a little line and select it and boost my line up to two uh, by hitting my stroke weight. So now I can go in and I've got a little thicker line. So I kind of preset, set my preset to be two point. Now, maybe that kind of shot me in the foot a little bit here because look at the beak. If I tap my mouse right there, it is bigger than the tip of my bird beak. Mayday, mayday. My paintbrush didn't change when I clicked the button. Which button? Like the, the, the stroke color, well, not stroke, but like the paintbrush color. So make sure it's stroke, not fill. So you can do that right down here when you have your paintbrush selected. So select your paintbrush. Make sure that this is stroke, not fill. Oh, that's what I did. Okay. Because the paintbrush is stroke. Yep. And I'm actually going to make sure it's one point. The reason I'm going to make it sure it's one point is because I'm going to take my paintbrush and I'm going to fill this in. So you see how I'm just... And I'm just clicking and dragging. And everybody should love this because it's paint by numbers. Right, it's paint by numbers. I'm just staying inside my line and doing a little bit of a fill of it. And I'm using it and make sure that you're on your colorize or color layer and your line drawing layer is locked. So my photo temp is locked and hidden. My sketch layer, which was my original doodle, is hidden and locked. My colorize layer is the color that I'm filling in. That's visible and not locked. And my final line art is visible but locked. And I'm just filling in my beak a little bit. And so I'm just taking my paintbrush and filling in my beak, which you can see 
I went over and just kind of filled each area so that my beak is completely filled. Now, I do know from my photo that part of the beak is a little darker than the other parts of the beak. So if I hide my color eyes and I turn on my photo, you see down there, it's actually a little darker than, this part's a little darker than the top part. Now, this comes down to style, right? Personal style as to how I wanna color in this guy. So now that I have my stroke selected, so you see it right there? I have my stroke selected so that my color over here says Pantone P23-5. I can click on the little three lines in the corner and change it to CMYK. Now you'll notice, see how it's nice and pure color? There's no like little weird percentages like 0.12 and 33.25%. This is a pure mixture. But you also notice we can add a little black to this color. So watch if I scroll it up to let's say 20%, 20%. Now watch when I color in the bottom of his beak. So you should be able to see that the bottom of his beak is a little darker now. Now, if I'm doing this as an organic illustration, what would be like a watercolor, I'm actually gonna go outside the line a little bit. So you see this, this is just me creating a little bit of an organic style to my drawing. Like I'm actually just giving it a little personality now, going outside the line a little bit to create a little bit more of an organic texture. Now, if I was going in and doing a real detailed drawing, of this beak, I might change the black percentage a couple of times and change my stroke weight a little bit. So look what I did, I added a little more black. So now I have my original Pantone kind of coppery beige. I have the 20% black tint to my color to shade the bottom of the beak. And now I went in and added even more black to my color and made the stroke weight 0.25 and I'm adding some details to my beak. Now this is style, right? This is a little bit of style being added to my illustration. So look at what it looks like now. I have one Pantone color, two tint colors, meaning adding black to it. And I have in essence, three stroke weights. I use two point to color in the beak, one point to shade in the bottom of the beak and 0.25 points paintbrush to add the details. Now, if you're OCD like me, I would remember that the three point fills the shape in, the two point shades it, and the one point, 0.25 details it. And that would be part of my kind of sketching style. Like that's how I would characterize my sketching style. So I'm gonna continue that process. So I'm gonna go back and make it two point. I'm going to go to my swatches library and I'm gonna pick pure black and I'm gonna fill in my eyeball. So watch what I did. I'm gonna click, 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 click. So I filled in my eyeball. Now I'm gonna take a shade of gray. So you're gonna notice my style is one Pantone color, two tints. So the beak is one color bronze and then added black for shadowing and added black for detailing. So my eyeball, I'm gonna use black as my Pantone color. And then I'm gonna use a shade of gray as my shadowing. So shade of gray is my shadowing. 
And then I'm gonna use a different shade of gray for my detail. So I'm in essence using a Pantone color and two tints, what they call two tints. And two tints means you're adding or subtracting black from your Pantone color. And so now I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna change my stroke weight. And I'm gonna add the eyeball. So I have a Pantone color and two tints, and I have three stroke weights. Two point stroke weight to fill in, one point stroke weight to shadow, and a 0.25 or 0.5 stroke weight to detail. So in essence, three colors, three stroke weights. And that's just the style I'm using for this particular illustration. That's the style I'm using for this particular illustration. So if I hide now my final line, you'll see that it's in essence watercolored in. So that's what it looks like without the lines. So it's water colored in. And so I'm gonna continue the process now and I'm gonna color the head of this thing, just so that you see I'm using the exact same style that I was using to do the beak. So first off, I'm gonna do the two point stroke, two point stroke with a stroke of a dark black, like a dark shade of gray. So I'm gonna go over to my swatches library. I'm gonna pick one of the dark shades. And I'm going to color this thing in. And so I'm just gonna to start to shade it in a little bit. Now I'm gonna do the main chunks of this thing using my two point. And then I'm gonna go back in with my one point. So I'm just generating a more organic style of illustration, just to show you a more organic style. So two point, one point, and 0.25 is basically the two sizes I'm using of stroke weight in order to create my illustration, just so that you can see my process. Now, if I zoom in, you'll notice that if I wanted to, I can bleed into my shape. So watch if I take my brush and I just tap inside the shape a little bit. You'll actually notice that inside the line gets a little bit of the bleed. And so it actually added a highlight to the eye of the bird. So you can actually see the little highlight there. And that's all based on my sketch compared to my detailed finish line and any spaces or shapes that might be in there. And so I'm quickly kind of coloring this thing in so you can see what a more organic style of illustration is. And so now I have it pretty much, I'm gonna change the stroke weight down to one so I can get into these little grooves. And I'm still in my pretty dark color because I know the top of his head and I'm using the space bar to pan around my image a little bit. And there's lots of ways to do this style based on you know, what you're drawing. So now I'm gonna go back to my swatches and I'm gonna crank down my percentage a little bit because I wanna color in the top of his head a little bit of the lighter color. I'm just creating a style here. That's what I'm trying to show you that there's lots of ways to use digital tools to create a style. 
And style can include color. Style can include like brush style, how you're drawing, right? That's a style. Color can be a style. When you see how we apply some different effects, textures and sorts to our drawings, that can, can create a style, a personality to how you draw. And so I'm just shading this in a little bit with the lighter color. And I'm actually going past my lines a little bit so you can see that I'm trying to create something that appears a little more organic. And I'm gonna to change to my 0.25 by typing in 0.25 into my stroke. And then I'm gonna go back into my swatches and I'm gonna make it a little darker because I'm gonna add some of the details to it. And this is just part of this particular, a little bit more organic illustration style. And my line detail might be a little different. The amount of details I put into it based on what, you know, what I'm trying to create. And I'm gonna use my selection arrow and delete a few lines because I don't know if I need all of them. So I'm just using them as texture. All right, so if I zoom out, And so now you can see the style that I'm using, much more organic, much more natural. Now, the more steady I am with my pen, the more smooth even the shapes would be of my lines. If I don't like this line around my beak, maybe I delete that. I go back to my stroke, my brush. I go a little steadier with my line. So it's smoother. This line under his eye is a little jagged. So I'm gonna go in with my brush and I'm gonna create a smoother version of it. And so now you can really see that this drawing is an attempt at this bird in a little bit more organic way. Now we could go in and doodle this bird all day long because we're only doing the head. We're only doing 2.1 point and 0.5 point, two point to fill, one point to shadow, 0.5 to do detail lines. And I mean, I could draw this whole bird and you can already see that this bird is becoming a more realistic style of paintbrush, pencil, shading in, detailing, a little bit of bleeding through, and I'm just generating my own style. And anyone that's following along in the classroom, at home, watching this recording, yours gonna look totally different than mine. Even though we're in essence using the same process, you probably picked a color probably close to mine. I don't know if you did, um, but yours is gonna have a similar kind of attempted look, but a totally different style. It's based on how you use the mouse. It's based on kind of your vision of shape because we are doing some subjective interpretation. My beak is much smoother and elongated than my original doodle sketch. Yours might be a little more square and a little bit more wide. I mean, we're trying to stay in the same nature, but I'm really happy with this bird head. The beak looks pretty good. The head is two-toned. It's got the darker shade at the bottom, the lighter shade towards the top. It follows the feathers of the photo, which you can see. The eyeball has a dark range. It has a shadow in it and it has the pupil. So I'm really starting to get kind of what I was looking for. I could use my paintbrush and just tap circles and create a style. If you know this from art, 
history, if you ever did any art history, this is called pointillism, right? And we could create some texture on the bird using points, right? Little circle dots to create texture. I don't know if you've ever seen artists that do pointillism and they do an entire painting using only dots. Oh my goodness. I don't know how in the world anyone does that, but it's a style, right? So we're just doing something a little more natural in nature. We're trying to be more organic with what we're doing. All right, so that's the organic style. So we're gonna now replicate the head using our sketch, but we're not going to do it organically. We're going to do it graphically. So you can see what the difference of those two styles are. Totally different in nature so that you can see that you can start in two worlds, graphic and organic, and spawn off all kinds of looks based on it. So I'm gonna, now that I have my colorized version, I, I really like this. I, I think this could be a really nice beginning to a sketch. Uh, I don't know how yours is turning out, but uh, this is mine and I'm pretty happy with it. It's got a couple of different shades and tones. It's got a good perspective. It's got a good start to the bird head. If I popped in an orange chest here, man, everyone would be like Oreo bird. You did a really good job with that. Um, okay, so that's the beginning of my little t-shirt illustration or my little packaging illustration. If anyone needed a bird head for an illustration, here's a really good start to one. All based on a photo, just getting scale and proportion and adding my own personality to it. Okay, so I'm gonna lock the colorize layer. I'm gonna turn back on my sketch layer and I'm gonna turn off colorized and final line. So here is my sketch that I did to start off this whole process, right? This is my original sketch. Now, instead of doing organic, we are going to do graphic now. So I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna use the space bar. Now we already know the beak, right? We did the beak here from, uh, from our doodle sketch. And we already know from our final drawing that we really rounded that thing out, right? So now I'm gonna select my sketch layer and I'm going to add a new layer for my sketch layer. And I'm gonna name it graphic underscore color. So instead of colorize, I'm gonna use the term graphic underscore color. So I know that this is my modern or more graphic interpretation of my doodle sketch. And I'm also gonna add another layer and I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna name this one graphic outline. So now I have graphic color, graphic outline, colorized layer and final line layer. So there's a distinction between my organic color and line detail and my graphic color and line detail. Okay, now, when you're drawing in graphic line format, think logos, symbols, iconography, uh, environmental graphics, things that need to be bold so that it directs your audience to do something specifically or process something specifically very quickly. The pen tool is what we need, right? The pen tool is what creates those smooth Bezier shapes in order to create something far more graphic. So now we're going to do the graphic outline and we're going to lock the graphic color because we need to do the graphic outline, outline the beak so that we have a much more bold and graphic shape solution for our bird. So our bird beak needs to be sharp. It needs to be smooth. It needs to have a different feel than our little pencil or paintbrush. I don't care how well you are with your mouse, with the pencil and the paintbrush, it's going to be organic because it doesn't have that uh, digital Bezier pen tool effect to it that it does when you use the pen tool. So let's switch to the pen tool and let's make sure that our stroke, see our stroke here, let's make sure that we're in pure black. So I'm gonna make sure that my stroke line is pure black. So you can either double click on it over here and just make sure that it's pure black, 100% black, or you can click on the little swatch 
on your swatches library at the top for pure black. Either way, you need to make sure it's pure black. Now, this is where the love of the pen tool comes into play because we need to create a more graphic, smooth shape for our beak. So I'm gonna tap my cursor at the top of my beak and I'm gonna go right down to the end here and I'm gonna click and drag a line for my beak. Now you're all already gonna notice if I go this way, it curves in. If I go this way, it curves out. Now, I need to create something. So I'm gonna drag like 45 degrees. So you see how I drag my angle about 45 degrees. It's not 90 degrees. It's not zero degrees. It's kind of like in this 45 degree range. I'm gonna drag it to about 45 degrees and extend it out to curve it. Now you'll notice when I move my mouse, Look at how the beak has a perfectly rounded end to it. The reason it does is because the Bezier curves at a 45 degrees and it's pulled out. So it gives me a nice curve to the beak, AKA chapter one in your book. It's all about using the pen tool and using these nodes. Remember this little dot's called a node or an anchor point and create a line. So I'm gonna go about halfway down the beak line and I'm gonna pull and drag pull and drag. Now you'll notice if I pull and drag along the line, it has smart guides and it kind of helps me continue along that line. I did do a pretty good job with my sketch line for the bottom of the beak. So I'm just going to pull it a little bit and follow that line. So I'm going to release and then I'm going to go to the end of my beak line. But I know this beak wiggles, right? This beak wiggles because it's got a couple of grooves as part of the beak. So I'm going to go out to about here and I'm gonna click and drag. So I'm gonna give my beak a wiggle. So you see how I pull and drag that line? So I pull and drag that line to give the beak a little wiggle. So now you'll notice, so I'm just gonna create a smooth beak. A, now this is stylistic as well, based on how many wiggles how many grooves, how many shapes are in your beak? I could have literally flattened this beak out like this and it just be one smooth shape, but I am gonna give it a few wiggles. So I'm gonna click and drag, and then I'm gonna go back. Remember when you get back to the beginning of the shape, you get the little circle. That means, do you wanna close the shape? See the little circle that appears? I'm gonna close the shape and I'm just gonna pull and drag a little bit. Now, look at the difference in this shape than my other shape. So I'm gonna use my selection tool and I'm just gonna deselect so you can see how smooth that line is. And I'm gonna go into layers and I'm gonna hide my sketch line. And look how smooth that beak line is. It's a graphic shape. It is no longer wiggle sketch. It is no longer final line. Look at final line. I'm gonna hide my graphic outline. Look at this one. It has all these little wiggles and it's kind of a little bit more organic. I'm making a more precise shape. So there is my graphic outline, a much more purposeful, smooth. Think of the guy's face in chapter number one where you're doing something a little more purposeful and even your shadow shapes or anything like that. He has three different tints on his face too. So we're actually gonna do the exact same process we did with the organic drawing, but we're gonna use the pen tool and make it graphic. So I'm gonna select, once I have that shape drawn, I'm gonna select the shape and go to my stroke line and make it two point so that it matches my paintbrush thickness. So there is my beak at two point in a more graphic style. So if I hide my sketch, you're going to see that beak is much more purposeful. Now, remember that our fill ins was a fill color, a shadow color, and a highlight color. So we're going to do the same process for this beak but we're gonna use the pen tool so that we do perfect shapes when we do the fill color, we do the highlight color, and we do the shadow color. Same as this, right? 
fill color, shadow color, highlight color. We're just now going to do it with our pen tool so that it's absolutely perfect. So I'm gonna do the beak first and then I'm gonna go back and do the head. So I'm gonna lock the graphic outline, unlock the graphic color, make sure I'm on the graphic color layer. I'm actually gonna hide my sketch layer too because all I have is the beak right here, right? This is my beak. So I'm gonna take my pen tool and instead of stroke color, I'm gonna do fill color. And with the fill color, I'm gonna pick my bronze color that I use to do my organic sketch, right? We're gonna do the exact same process. We're just gonna do it with the pen tool instead of the pencil and the paintbrush so we get a more organic solution. So I'm gonna take now my pen tool and I'm gonna replicate my shape. And you'll notice that for the graphic version, I'm staying inside my black line. And the reason I'm doing that is because I wanna make sure it fills it perfectly. So look how perfect that is. There's no bleed, there's no anything. So now my shape is perfectly filled and my beak is perfectly shaped. Totally different styles, right? I used the paintbrush and squiggled in and used the paintbrush and add a little line details. Now I'm doing what's called a more graphic style for my illustration, all based on my original photo of this bird. So now I have my beak shape created and I have my fill created. Now, in the book version of your graphic pen tool, it does the person's shape. And the person's shape has a fill color, which we just did here. The person's head has an outline, which we just did here. And the person's head has shadows and highlights as individual shapes. Shadows and highlights as individual shapes. We're gonna do the exact same thing here. So once I have the fill head filled in, the beak filled in, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna use my pen tool and I'm gonna create my shadow shape. Remember the tint, right? The tint. So we're gonna go into our color and we're gonna switch it. Oh, we're gonna switch it to CMYK. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did for the organic drawing. I'm just gonna add black to my color. So I'm gonna go like 25% or so. Now watch with my pen tool, instead of squiggling my pen tool, I'm gonna create a graphic shape. So I'm gonna click my mouse. I'm gonna go down to this corner. I'm gonna click and drag and I'm gonna connect the shape. And now you'll see, look how perfect that little shape is. Now in the book, the person's head has the exact same shapes and they leave space between the fill color and the shadow color. So you see how there's a space here of the fill color and a shape for the shadow color. This is what constitute graphic fill or graphic color. There is a space between the fill color and the shadow color. Now, I could have, I'm gonna undo. I could have, I'm gonna use my pen tool. I could have filled in part of this. So watch if I make my shape like this. Totally different look, right? By bleeding under the shape and making a graphic line, look how straight that line is. Totally different look because I only let the color bleed through at the bottom here. So this looks totally different shape-wise than the other one because I did bleed under it. I did watercolor under it a little bit. So I'm gonna delete that shape and I'm gonna go back to the shape I had because I actually like having a shape that 
doesn't touch the beak. And look, I just added wiggles to this shape that I didn't have in my other one. So you see how this has a couple of nooks and crannies now, a couple of little shape wiggles. It's because I clicked and dragged the pen tool to give it a curve. Now your book, the reason you're gonna practice a little bit and do a couple of little mini projects in the book is because the Bezier curve is what your chapter one is. So watch what happens when I click and drag, right? Every time I click and drag, it adds a curve to my line. Right, that shape is totally different than this shape. Now, the key to the Bezier curve, which I taught you in graphic design one, was you can always remove the forward anchor. So see how I move my line and it automatically starts curving again? So I, if I click and drag, I automatically start the curve. So to do a straight line, I have to click, 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 click. I'm gonna undo. Remember, you can click and drag the curve, remove the forward anchor. So you see when I move there, you get the V. I can draw a straight line. I can click and curve, remove the forward anchor, click a straight line, click and drag. So I can control what lines curve and what lines are straight by removing the forward anchor. But do keep in mind that when you remove the forward anchor, this straight thing happens. See this little buckle in the line? The buckle in the line is because we removed the forward anchor. So if you want everything to smoothly curve around, practice by doing more pen points to make your shape. So you see how I'm spending a little bit more time adding more points? The reason I'm doing that is because I wanna make sure that my lines smoothly curve around my shape versus removing the forward anchors and making straight lines combined with curve lines. And I say that and you can go out to the mural in the lobby right here and there's an area in the bird's beak that has a flatness to it and it's not perfectly curved all the way around. The designer actually removed the forward anchor when he was creating that shape and then curved again, and you can see a buckle in the line. That isn't the printing of the sticker. The artwork actually has a very tiny buckle in the line. My OCD, I would have gone back and added a point to that line and curved it out so it doesn't have the, the buckle drives me crazy. And I cross by it every single day going through the lobby. Any of the levels all have a mural of the hawk and there's a wiggle in the line. So. But that's part of pen practice and style, right? I could have, so I'm gonna delete this just for a minute. I could have created everything in 45s and 90s. And look at that style. It's different than having a pen tool shape that has a little bit of form to it. Right? This line's different too. A pen tool has its own personality too, based on how you use it. So just understand that part of that, whether it's a paintbrush, a pencil or pen tool has style too, because it's how you use the mouse, how you visualize shapes, how you wanna do it. When I was in high school, I used a pen, black pen all the time. And I drew everything in line art like this, no fill colors. And I was lucky, my art teacher was like, you should be a graphic artist. And I'm like, why? She's like, you see every shape really sharp and each shape with an outline, which is what this is. Each shape has an outline. The face in your book of chapter one, each highlight and shade inside that face has a distinct shape. That is seeing things in black and white. That is seeing things graphically. So if I need to create the little, little hole here for the nose, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna choose white and I'm gonna use my pen tool and I'm gonna zoom in. And if I didn't wanna use the circle tool because I don't want it to be a perfectly organic kind of shape here. So look at the difference. And I'm actually gonna take it even one step further. I'm gonna use my pen tool now and I'm gonna choose my swatch and I'm gonna add more black to it.
just so that you can see I'm using the exact three shapes that I used in the paintbrush. So I'm gonna go in now and just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna create a slightly darker shape overlapping my other shape. And now I'm gonna go in with my pen tool and I'm gonna create a subtle, tiny triangular shape that would be the line for the top of his beak. So take a look at that beak. This is a really graphic three color, two tint version of the beak that is totally different than the version of my watercolor. So look at that beak. And I'm actually, just for the sake of learning, I'm gonna move this beak away from the placement of the other beak so you can see it. So I'm gonna unlock these two layers. I'm gonna select it and I'm just gonna move it down. I know that it's not over the bird beak, but I'm doing it strictly to show you what the bird beak of the watercolor looks like and the bird beak of, I'm gonna move it even a little further. So let's hide that. I'm gonna move this thing way over, over here. Just so that you can see the difference. Lock that, lock that, turn that on, turn that on. Look at the two beaks. I mean, hopefully you can see the difference between this watercolor version of the beak and this graphic version of the beak. I squiggled with a pencil and a paintbrush to create the illustration of the realism or the organic beak. And I used a pen tool and made perfect shapes in order to create the graphic version of the beak. So these are two different styles of illustration using the same photo, using two, in essence, two different tools, organic, paintbrush, pencil, I could have actually used the pencil even to fill it in too. If I changed the thickness of the pencil, I could have scribbled that in too. I just chose the paintbrush. So in essence, I'm using an organic pencil to draw the more natural version of my illustration. And I'm using strictly the pen tool to create the graphic version. And hopefully you can see that those two styles are absolutely different. Your chapter one in your book is teaching you graphic Bezier shapes, graphic drawings for patterns and illustrations. I wanted to show you also organic version, all using a photo, all using a sketch as our doodle template, but all creating a different look based on two different styles of digital illustration. Now, the last little piece of the puzzle is the Pathfinder tool. Now, the Pathfinder tool is an important aspect of digital illustration in its graphic format because it allows us to merge, subtract, divide shapes to create this graphic solution to our illustration. So I'm just gonna use uh, the eyeball as a prime example. The eyeball is actually something that can be created using either the pen tool or the shape tool and the pathfinder tool to create a really good version of the eyeball. So I'm gonna use the shape tool because your book uses a lot of shapes in order to teach you the pathfinder tool uh, to cut things out and create things. So I'm gonna use the shape tool in order to teach you the pathfinder tool is the last little part of our lecture here, just for the graphic side of your book. So I'm gonna to switch to the circle or the ellipse tool and I'm going to create my eyeball for my bird. So I'm going to go back to my colorized graphic color and graphic outline. I'm gonna hide my 
final line and colorize because those were my organic drawings. I do have to turn my sketch back on for a minute because I got to move my beak back to where it's supposed to be. So I'm going to move this thing back just so that I'm in my basic scale and proportion, right? My basic scale and proportion. And I know my eyeball is basically in this little shape right here. So I'm going to lock my color again. And first is I'm going to create the outline for my eyeball. So I'm going to create the outline for my eyeball. So in my graphic outline, I'm going to create a circle or ellipse that has a stroke of black. So I have my ellipse tool selected. I have only stroke of black and I have uh, no fill color. And I'm going to take my mouse and I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to draw a circle. So there is my perfect circle. Holding down shift creates a perfect circle. If you don't like the location of it, switch to your selection tool and just get it in the right place. So I drew a perfect circle right there, right? And once I've drawn the perfect circle, I'm going to hide my sketch layer because I already know that it needs to go right there, right? That's the basic spot for my eyeball. And I'm gonna select my eyeball and make sure that it has a stroke weight of eh, two. I'm gonna do a stroke weight of two. So there's my eyeball. So my stroke weight of two matches my stroke weight of my outside of my beak. So you can see already, this should look way more graphic than my filling in. Look how perfect my beak is. Look how perfect my eyeball is. So that's the outline to my eyeball. Now. I'm going to go into my layers. Remember, that's my outline layer. So I'm going to lock that. I'm going to go into my color layer, right? Because I got to add color to my eyeball. But wait, I need my eyeball to perfectly fill in in dark gray. So why don't I just copy this circle? So I'm going to do edit copy my circle. And I'm going to lock my graphic outline. I'm going to go into my graphic color and unlock it. And I'm going to do edit, paste in place. Now, my shape is perfect. I have my outline and I have my thing pasted right inside of it. But instead of it be a stroke, I want to make it a fill. So I'm just going to hit the toggle switch in my palette down here, right? And I'm going to switch it from stroke to fill. So it has a black fill and a stroke of nothing. You can also do it in your color picker over here with the circle selected, just switch it from black outline to black fill. The reason we're doing that is because I actually wanna shade it in dark gray. Because remember the eyeball is a dark gray color. So you could draw the pen tool around it and create another circle shape or whatever you wanted, but I just copied the outline and pasted it in place in the color layer to add a little shade to it. Now, the reason I did it separate from the outline, the reason I did it separate from the outline is because there may, may be a time that I want just this right, just this, that I don't want the outline. And that's the outline. So I made the outline just outlines with no fills and the color layer, graphic color, just fills. So the eyeball is outlined and on the outline layer. And then there's a copy of the circle technically underneath it in the exact same place with just a dark gray. Now, Copying and pasting in place is a really good way to do that so that you know it's perfectly lined up. So I have my dark gray. So now that I have my dark gray, which is like my tint color, I'm gonna add my pupil. So I'm going to take my, give me a second and let me do the tint and the pupil and then I'll take a look. Um, so now I'm going to take my swatches and I'm gonna do a lighter color and I'm just gonna drag a circle. And then I'm gonna use my white color for my pupil and I'm gonna add the pupil. And so now you should see that this is 
a much more graphic version of the bird than I have in my sketch version. All right, so, okay, so if that's okay. So let's go to your outline layer and unlock it. And let's lock your fill layers. Now click on that fill. Put down the word fill. There we go. Now you can see it's a lock your outline and go back to your fill, click on your circle and make it a shade of gray. Make it a shade of gray? Yeah. So you can actually go into your swatch library. There you go. Just one of them. Yep, there you go. Now let's figure out. You hit the toggle switch and you have a white outline again. And you have, so you don't want that. Don't want outline. Yeah, so you remove the outline. All right, so now let's go back to your graphics. I just filled that in. I don't, I didn't think I did. Filled in that. So unlock that. Lock that. Click on that. Yeah, you see how, uh, so hit the toggle switch. See that little toggle? Toggle it and then, oh, hold on. Okay, it needs to be black. And now you have to click on the fill and unfill it. Ah. All right, we're good. So now I need not have right. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so now you're okay. And now you can click. Now you can use another circle, draw your little highlight, and then your last little circle, draw your little pupil. Now, just for the sake of the process, I'm going to bounce back and forth. So I'm going to show you the graphic outline and the graphic color. And look how different that looks than the sketch version. I mean, you should notice a drastically different style between the paintbrush and the pencil and our graphic solution. I mean, I was really happy with the graphic kind of sketch of the bird as organic. And I'm equally happy with the graphic beginning of the bird in the more like your book does in chapter one and chapter two, a much more smooth shaped version of your beak and your eyeball. Now, the last little piece of it is the Pathfinder tool. Now, the Pathfinder tool is how we can merge shapes to make new shapes, we can subtract from shapes to make different shapes in a really easy way. Now, the easiest way to show it is to create a tint shape for the eyeball. So underneath the eyeball right here, ideally would be a little bit of a dark color, right? A little bit of a dark color. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the dark gray. So you see how I have the dark gray selected? I'm gonna copy and paste the dark gray. So here it is right here. So this is the dark gray. So I just made a copy of it. The reason I made a copy of it is I'm gonna make another copy of it, copy and paste. So you see how I have two versions of the gray. I'm gonna overlap the two circles. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because you see the little shape that's created from the overlap? There's a little shape here. The Pathfinder tool is how you use shapes to merge or subtract and make new shapes. So I'm actually gonna take my selection tool and select both of these shapes. So just click and drag and, and select both shapes. Now, if you don't have the Pathfinder tool visible, you can get it from window, Pathfinder right down there. So we're gonna click on the Pathfinder tool and you're gonna notice this little thing here that says minus from front, which means that the back shape will be cut out based on what the overlap is on the front shape. So watch when I have both selected and I click minus. Oh, it only left what was visible overlapped from the shape on top of it. It subtracted that shape. Well, why is that important? Well, take a look at this. If I pick this color 
and I go into the swatch library and pick the dark color. Watch when I move it up here. Ooh, let me zoom in. I just made a shadow, perfectly smooth shadow underneath the eyeball. So let's do that again. What if I wanted to take the highlight, copy and paste it, here it is, copy and paste a copy of it, overlap it a little bit, and I could overlap it anywhere. What if I wanted to overlap it here? So look how I overlapped it off-centered. Overlap it off-centered, select both, use the Pathfinder tool and subtract it. So look at this highlight. So I'm gonna move it up to the eyeball. I'm gonna pick the color different. So look at the difference in that eyeball. It has two tints, but the tints are totally different than the paintbrush version of the tint. Look how graphic that is, how smooth that is. I mean, it is like, it is so pretty. Look at that eyeball. I use minus and I use unite all of the time. Subtract or minus and unite, the first two icons in the Pathfinder. So if I needed to use unite for this bird, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn on the sketch so I can get a basic idea. I'm going to use the circle tool to draw the beginning of this feather. So here's the circle tool. And I'm gonna make a feather by combining two shapes. So you see how I just used the circle tool to draw the end of that feather? Watch if I now use the pen tool. So I'm gonna use the pen tool. So you see this, this is uh, two shapes. So watch what happens if I select both of them. See how there's an overlap? And I go to Pathfinder, Unite. Look how this is one shape now. Well, that would be awesome if I was doing this bird, copy, paste, rotate, copy, paste, rotate, copy, paste, rotate, copy, paste, rotate. I could use the Unite tool to make one feather. Now look at what I did. Watch when I hide my layer now. Oh man, this is the beginning of something. You can actually see the beginning of the bird head without having the outline of the bird head. Creating a shape using the shape tool and the pen tool and merging the two shapes together to create feathers, to create the eyeball, to create parts of the beak. I mean, you can create some very graphic shapes that using the pen tool and the shape tool, complex shapes that you couldn't do any other way. Now watch if I copy and paste this, copy and paste, I'm gonna make it the lighter color. Look at this bird. I mean, this is, if I hold down shift and select all these and do the lighter color. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's so much easier in graphic world to create really interesting, bold illustrations 
using the pen tool, the shape tool, the pathfinder tool to create some really graphic solutions, all based on a doodle sketch with a pencil for scale and proportion over a photo. I'm gonna save this. I am gonna end the recording part because this is our two styles. Let me move, let me move the layers before I end the recording so you can see the difference. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna move this part of the head over there and I'm gonna turn on my colorized version and look at the difference of these two heads. I mean, totally different in nature based on the organic sketch and the graphic pen tool sketch. Now your book in chapter one and two is all about the graphic pen tool. But I wanted to introduce to you first the organic version so that those of you that are interested in a more free flowing style, you had that option as we start to introduce projects. I'm gonna let you doodle and I'm gonna end the recording so that those watching have a good, uh, I pushed about two hours, took me a little bit longer, but uh, a good recording.